Broadcasting from Sydney, Australia, this is Front and Centre with Emilio Garcia. Brought to you by the Unshackled.net. Safe Spaces, a place where you can shield yourself from the culture shock, opinions, and values that you enrolled in university to be exposed to. Trigger Warnings, the idea that a professor should state the obvious and warn you that you are about to be taught things that you didn't once know. Safe Spaces and Trigger Warnings have evolved far past their initial objectives. What caused this? Where did we go wrong? That's what we'll be exploring today on this episode of Front and Center. Hello and welcome to Front and Center. Thank you so much for being with us on this very special episode. This is an episode where we are debuting a new format for the episode, for the podcast rather. What I'm seeing daily, my daily news podcast, seem to be covering all the political issues that I'm seeing on a daily basis. So it seemed gratuitous to have a daily news podcast and a weekly news podcast. That's why I'm shifting this over to talk more about subject matters and to have more of a storyline uh, version of the show as opposed to a weekly uh, roundup of all of the news. On today's episode, we'll be talking about safe spaces and trigger warnings a craze that has become highly politicized and is now rampant on universities everywhere. One really important thing to take into consideration is that it wasn't always like this. Our story has an unlikely beginning. Safe spaces had nothing to do with education. In fact, the story begins in the 1960s, in the gay community. In the 60s, coming out was not simple. In my senior year, I was called in abruptly and they looked at me and said, Mr. Hall, we understand you have homosexual tendencies. And I said, yes, but was essentially primarily dismissed. The time was not a time when you were supposed to wear a little sign that says, hi, I'm a lesbian, be friendly with me. People were fired from their job, literally. People were put in mental institutions. People were given electric shock treatment against their wishes, certified as being mentally ill and incompetent. Well, I don't think I ever felt a sense of a gay community. Your generation is so much luckier and you can identify a gay community. There were laws in the U.S. prohibiting sodomy and homosexual behavior. These laws weren't officially overturned until 2003. In Australia, anti-gay laws were faded out by 1997. But think about that for a second. It was technically illegal to fuck someone a certain way 15 years ago. And so, in the 60s, with all the illegality and the social stigma of things, there was really only one place for gays to be gays. At gay bars. Most gay pubs in London at that time wanted to hide away gay people in the basement, usually. Gay bar call the silver dollar. You went straight in off the street and there were all these marvelous men, hundreds of them. And of course it became my second home. It doesn't take a large stretch of the imagination to understand why gay people would seek out a space where they could be themselves. Splinter, which is a liberal spoon-feeding bullshit out outlet, actually wrote a pretty accurate uh, article about this. Incredibly self-righteous, but very good article about the history of safe spaces. In this article, they describe the safe spaces as follows. Gay bars were not safe in the sense of being free from risk, nor were they safe as in reserved. A safe place was where people could find practical resistance to political and social repression. But did this resistance to repression mean excluding heterosexual people? We had our own language and our own places um, and you know straight if straight people ventured into them they very soon realized that what kind of a place it was and they either stayed and put up with it or did you know left in other words this was an area where a concentration of similar people created a sense of security and comfort but gay bars were not an area free from straight people this is still true today, of course. A friend of mine who works at one tells me that there are married dudes that go to his bar all the time uh, and really get into the spirit of it, but that's another subject completely. In a, but in essence, it's interesting to note that safe spaces were never an area that excluded other people. It was just an area of concentration. 
And in the early days of safe spaces on schools, they weren't about excluding people either. They weren't even called safe spaces. In their earliest form, they were an informal gathering of mostly black students that came together after desegregation to provide support and comfort to each other in a really new environment. So, these are the origins of safe spaces. We're going to talk about trigger warnings after this short break. I want to take a second and ask you to go to theunshackled.net and download your free ebook, The Unshackled Battlefield. Learn today about the founding principles of The Unshackled and what made the organization what it is today. Thanks, and now back to the show. Welcome back to Front and Center. I'm Emilio Garcia. Before the break, we discussed the history of safe spaces and how they got started. Now let's move on to trigger warnings and what made it seem appropriate to warn people about certain content. That's exactly what it sounds like. After World War I, soldiers were coming back to the US and found it hard to adapt to their regular lives. They often found themselves feeling anxious and vigilant, as they did during combat. This used to be called soldier's heart, or shell shock, but nowadays it's called post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. By any name, it's a horrible affliction, and it's hard to shake. It was the vivid flashbacks, the anxiety, that led educators to consider a content warning, where they would warn students that during their subject, they would be talking about certain things that may be triggering to someone who has a traumatic experience in their past. Professor Marguerite Johnson describes this practice best in her recent talk about university culture. As a cultural historian of the ancient Mediterranean, whose teaching and research involves uh, sort of confrontational subjects. My areas are ancient sexualities, ancient genders, uh, ideas of eros and amor and eroticism in the Greek and Roman worlds, the roles of women. I have for a very long time, uh, before it was sort of a current um, sort of topic of, of uh, pedagogical and political obsession, used basic content warnings in my course guides. I won't use the term trigger warning. I think that has become so politicised. Now, this isn't off base, right? I don't think anyone would have an objection to a professor letting potentially traumatised students know that they may want to go to the enrollment office and select another course. Seems reasonable, right? It is no longer a safe space for me. And I find that incredibly depressing. Oh, oh we should go. Oh! How in the fuck did that happen? It seems like in the good old days, safe spaces and trigger warnings weren't all that bad. In fact, get-togethers that made people feel more secure and warnings to anyone who maybe isn't ready for a class is pretty good, right? Well, like many things, including late-night television and the NFL, crazy leftist-ish idiots had to ruin it. Regarding that video or that recording, if you're listening to this uh, podcast, let's make one thing clear. It is not the job of a university to make you feel comfy or to make a home for you. It is to make sure that no one leaves their university being as stupid as the people that you just saw in that video. It's hard to pinpoint exactly when the idea of safe spaces and trigger warnings went off the rails, but it's not a stretch of the imagination to place part of the blame on leftist millennial culture of uh, entitled little shits who believe it's everyone's job to make them happy. So it's clear that this isn't just happening in college campuses, but the lefty entitled ideology is seen everywhere leftists talk about any issues. The Guardian published an article titled, 
why there is nothing racist about black-only spaces. I won't go into the nitty-gritty of this article, but let me be extremely clear when I say that creating an area exclusive to one race or exclusive to another is racist by definition, pure and simple. In the University of Sydney, there are two rooms that are only accessible to their Aboriginal students. This historic university will exclude you from entering certain parts of their building based on your racial background. Now, I know that the University of Sydney means no harm, but to say that it's appropriate to create an area exclusive for one racial heritage is, in my opinion, wrong regardless of intention. And if that isn't fucked up enough, why don't you take a listen to what many believe constitutes trigger warning worthy subjects? What should be labelled when you're lecturing? Uh, what, what topics require a trigger warning? This is a direct quote. <clears throat> I begin. Swearing, rape, abuse, physical, mental, emotional, verbal abuse, child abuse, pedophilia, self-injurious behaviour, self-harm, eating disorders, etc. Take talk of drugs, talk of drug use, illegal, legal, illegal or psychiatric, suicide, descriptions, pictures of medical procedures, even if they don't contain blood or gore, descriptions, pictures of violence or warfare, including instruments of violence, such as knives or guns, corpses, skulls, skeletons, needles, discussions of isms, shaming or hatred of any kind, Racism, classism, hatred of cultures, ethnicities that differ from your own, sexism, hatred of sexualities or gender that differ from your own, your own. anti-multiple, non-vanilla shaming, sex positive shaming, fat shaming, body image shaming, neuroatypical shaming. Any time <coughs> slurs are used in your class, this includes words like stupid or dumb, which are still widely considered to be socially acceptable, trans, degendering or anti-trans views of bodies, dismissal of lived depressions, marginalisation, illness or difference, kidnapping, be it forceful <laughs> deprivation, when is kidnapping not, of <laughs> disregard for personal autonomy, discussions of sex, even, con even brackets, consensual, death or dying, spiders, insects, snakes, <laughs> <coughs> vomit, pregnancy, childbirth, blood, serious injury, uh, tripophobia, which is phobia of irregular patterns, or clusters of small or small holes or bumps, scarification, Nazi paraphernalia, slimy things, anything that might inspire intrusive thoughts in people with OCD. End quote. Call me old-fashioned but I don't think anyone should be warned about the possibility of food turning up in a lecture. Okay, rape, violence, and war seem appropriate because they are subjects that someone could get triggered over, legitimately triggered. But gooey stuff? Give me a fucking break. This brings us to the centrist conclusion segment of the program. When it comes to trigger warnings and safe spaces, when properly implemented, can be helpful and important measures towards helping certain students who have any form of post-traumatic stress disorder or are in an environment that they don't understand at all. However, the trend has extended far past its initial pragmatic objective and has moved into some really murky territory where students are expected to be shielded from opposing points of view, or discomfort, or any form of unpleasantness in general. This is not something that should be taken lightly. The people being molded today in uni are people who are going to have power in the future. Business owners, legislators, teachers, parents, all people with real influence, though to different degrees. Are we going to have a law against mansplaining? Are there going to be Aboriginal, Black, Latino exclusive neighborhoods? Will racial insensitivity carry jail time? Will your freedom of speech be regulated to make sure no one is offended by it? This is not a crazy concept. Legislators, politicians, prime ministers, presidents, 
They are just people with opinions, pleasing constituents with opinions. If youth culture falls into a pit, when the youth becomes a standard, the country falls in the pit with them. That's the end of this episode of Front and Center. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you to The Unshackled for allowing us to use their platform. If you have any ideas or opinions, tweet at me at FRNT and Center, or find me on Facebook. I'll read the most interesting comments on the air. Remember to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. There are always two sides to the story, so keep it central. Thanks for tuning in to Front and Center. Please visit frontandcenter.net.au for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.